I'm a, trained as a PhD in microbiology, and I work with a number of medical teams. The one that I work with here predominantly is the orthopedic surgery team of Allegheny General Hospital. And that's the, they are my direct employers, but I'm associated with the Center for Genomic Sciences, which is part of Allegheny Singer Research Institute, which is a really red-hot research institute associated with the Allegheny General Hospital. My hobby is climbing, and uh, I was very, very interested in alpine streams. I wanted to do the microbiology of alpine streams. <laughs> and I also wanted to put my expenses on my research grants. So I really seriously wanted to combine uh, climbing and microbiology. Now, a very unusual combination. So what I did was to get into the Bugaboo Range, which is a bunch of vertical granite in uh, the Selkirk Range in British Columbia. And I tackled a, an alpine stream that was just banging down over the rocks. And I was looking at the bacterial population of that stream. And rather than finding that they were floating around and moving with the water over the rocks, I found that they were in slime, stuck to surfaces. The actual count of bacteria in the stream was eight, organ, eight cells per milliliter. That's almost sterile. Whereas the rocks were so slippery, you could go right off your feet and land on your rear end. Uh, in the water. So basically, it was an examination of an alpine stream that showed that 99.99 recurring of the bacteria were stuck on surfaces and not floating around in the fluids. Well, the interesting thing was that bacteria had been seen on teeth, and that was the scuff that Van Leeuwenhoek saw in his first experimentations way back 300 years ago. So we knew that some bacteria in some circumstances made what they called plaque on teeth, and that is a biofilm. And we've known that for a very long time. But what I discovered was that biofilms were everywhere, not just on teeth. They were in the mountain streams or in other streams. Later on, we found them in just about every environment. But it's a bit of a tragedy. In fact, it's a major tragedy. When Cox methods were used, those are cultures, to study acute bacterial diseases like diphtheria and typhoid and and the epidemic diseases uh, that went through the, through the world. Uh, then, like plague, for example, the bacteria were, were largely floating. The ones that were attacking the humans were largely planktonic floating bacteria. And uh, you got challenged, bingo. I mean, you got really hit hard with a whole bunch of bacteria. And you either died in four or five days or you survived. If you made it past a week or ten days, you're probably going to be immune for the rest of your life. Those were the acute diseases. And Cox methods of diagnosing with culture work extremely well on those acute infections. But with the progress of microbiology over the years, we've actually solved those problems. We don't have diphtheria or typhoid or plague very much anymore in the developed world. And so we began to see a bunch of infections that were slow developing. They were a different kind of infection. And I looked at them one by one, and they were all caused by biofilms. And tragically, biofilms don't show up on cultures. It takes those floating cells to be positive on the culture plates. It really is very strange. Microbiology is in two separate camps. The people who work in hospitals are medical microbiologists, and the rest of microbiologists are a sort of a, a fast-moving research group. And we gave up on analyzing water and soil populations using cultures in the late 1970s, early 80s. So cultures are only used in the medical side. And now we realize that cultures are just not very good at picking up biofilm infections and particularly in orthopedics where I'm working and you get an infected knee or you get an infected hip, it runs culture negative all the time and the surgeons will just treat it like an infection, treat it with antibiotics, but the nuisance of it being culture negative is really bad because you don't know which bacteria you're dealing with and you don't know which antibiotics to use. So we're now crystallizing a new method of looking at uh, bacterial infections in orthopedics using quite different techniques. We're out of the culture era. But the culture era ended in general microbiology in the late 1970s. It just persisted into the 2010s because it's a little cheaper. 
than the molecular methods and because it's a little bit more handy to handle in the lab. A great many gentlemen my age will be affected by prostatitis. They'll live with it for the rest of their lives. They'll get intermittent antibiotic therapy for the acute episodes, but they've got a biofilm in their prostate. And we really can't quite convince even the medical people in the area yet that it's a biofilm disease and it should be treated in a biofilm way. And the biofilm way is big doses of antibiotics, very consistently, and sometimes even the removal of the organ uh, prophylactically to stop the infection, because biofilms really can't be treated with little doses of antibiotic. They have to be dug out. And when they're dug out, then the problem is resolved. It's like a hip that goes sour on you. You have to have the hip replaced with a new one under antibiotic cover, and you're fine. So basically in biofilms, you have to dig them out and have to do major things to get them solved. The old remedies don't work. And there's a lot of these infections around, great many of these infections. 14 million people in the U.S. per year are affected by biofilm infections. And yet mostly these people are treated as if they were planktonic infections. If we can make the switch, a paradigm shift completely, then we can get better therapy for a huge number of bacterial infections. The worst thing that could possibly happen is if we keep treating bacterial infections as if they were planktonic, the old-fashioned infections that are now mostly gone, is that we'll misdiagnose. That is, we'll think something is an inflammation when it's really a bacterial infection. And the classic example is ulcers, which now turn out to be a bacterial infection. They're treated with antibiotics. We just didn't know that they were bacterial. When you have a, a cancer, you have a body of the cancer, and you have metastasis. That is, little pieces of the cancer will go somewhere else and start to grow. And this is exactly the problem we have with biofilm infections. For example, if you have a biofilm endocarditis, it can seed into your lungs, it can seed into your brain, and it can produce all kinds of little biofilms that jam in your capillary beds and cause stroke and cause pneumonia in the lung. So basically a biofilm infection is something that's seeded somewhere, just like a cancer. And like the cancer metastasizes to different area, the biofilm also spreads to different areas. And we can have a strategy that stops that spread. And in fact, you use antibiotics to stop single bacteria from migrating somewhere and setting up a new biofilm. So exact parallel between biofilms and cancer. Bacteria, when they're growing somewhere in a biofilm, are lasting longer in contact with the tissues than we like to happen. In the old days, you know, you were cured in a week or you were finished. So basically, the bacteria were only in contact with the tissues for a short time. But we know now that there are cancers associated with various things that happen in the prostate. So if we know that something's happening in the liver, clonorchis infection is a case in point, and bacteria get started there, we know that the irritation that the bacteria cause can cause cancer directly. So in at least two instances, having a bunch of bacteria where they shouldn't be in contact with the human tissue, in the liver in one case and in the prostate in the other case, they are, if you like, an irritant, and irritants cause cancer by causing the mutation in the first place. So two direct links to cancer so far, and I think many more to come. You don't want a bunch of bacteria hanging around in tissue for a long period of time, producing strange chemicals, including carcinogenic chem chemicals. So it's important, very important, that we clear up biofilm infections. Three different people in the last three years have discovered compounds that cause biofilms to disperse and make planktonic cells that simply sit around. And those planktonic cells are extremely sensitive to antibiotics. Now, getting the FDA to approve a totally new class of compounds and choosing our ground really carefully. So on one side, the biofilm scientists are beavering away looking at biofilms and finding dispersing agents. 
And on the other side, the clinicians could really use those dispersing agents, but we have to be very careful so as not to disperse good biofilms and not to cause any side effects of any kind. So a marriage of the biofilm science and the medical microbiology, and the clinicians on the other side, could really produce some quite spectacular cases. And I'm looking to dentistry for some of the earlier ones because uh, a single tooth that doesn't contain a whole bunch of bacteria, it's not like a cystic fibrosis lung, and perhaps we could disperse the bacteria in a root canal problem and cause them to be cleaned up with antibiotics and go at it slowly. And there's two other things that have come out of biofilm engineering that are really interesting. Biofilms don't like DC current, just direct current, electrical current, and they don't like ultrasound at certain frequencies. And these are really, really exciting right now because what we could do in orthopedics particularly is get right next to a metal prosthesis. You've got the prosthesis here and a biofilm growing on the surface. And if we could produce an electrical current right along that surface, make the bacteria extremely unhappy, make them very sensitive to antibiotics, or in fact even kill them, then we could actually begin to focus into the body, sometimes by just induced currents in a very non-invasive way, electrical currents and ultrasound. And uh, in, by golly, in the lab, you get a bacterial biofilm going along like 60 and hit it with the DC or hit it with the ultrasound. It really doesn't like it. We've got to understand science and how science works. Science is a curiosity-driven examination of various phenomena. You really want to understand things in detail and in considerable depth. And the benefits that come to the human community come off of this because you can't really deal with an infection unless you understand the infection. So there's two drivers. The first driver, and the one that really, really gives me a lot of really good days, is the curiosity driver. And we just discovered a year and a half ago that the bacteria inside a biofilm have little connections running between the cells so that the cytoplasm, the internal guts of one cell, is actually communicating with the cytoplasm of another cell. And there's electrical wires running back and forth between the cells, so it's a community. It's pulsing and talking, and if you stimulate one side of the community, the message goes all the way across the community real fast. Now that's not directly connected to medicine in any way. But basically, that's what motivates the scientists. We have scientists who are solving a scientific problem, and all the information's there, all pretty much neglected, really, and then you come in and you plug in, and very, very good things happen. But they happen best through personal friendships.